As heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. We've had several episodes before about mysterious locations that are host to strange, paranormal activity. Skinwalker Ranch, for example, or the Bennington Triangle, or even the harsh terrain of Alaska. Perhaps one of the locations that appears to persistently slip under the radar, though, is the San Luis Valley in Colorado. The region is home to very much the same variety of paranormal activity as other apparent hotspots. UFO sightings here are in abundance, for example, as are cases of cattle mutilation, sightings of strange creatures, and even alien abduction. In short, the San Luis Valley could be one of the most interesting locations in the world. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. Coming up in this episode, the paranormal, extraterrestrial, Bigfoot, and otherworldly connections to cattle mutilations. If you're new here, welcome to the show. And while you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, my newsletter, to enter contests, to connect with me on social media. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression or dark thoughts. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the Weird Darkness. Although part of the San Luis Valley crosses over into New Mexico, the vast majority resides in the south-central region of Colorado. Once owned by Mexico, it became part of the United States after the Mexican-American War of 1846 to 1848. Since then, the region has enjoyed a multicultural existence, and perhaps because of this, shares a rich history of legends, myths, and very real chilling accounts. While we will shortly examine some of the cases of UFOs and other strange goings-on in the San Luis Valley region, as well as one of the most well-known, if grim, encounters of the region, cattle mutilation, as well as sightings of many strange creatures, we'll first turn our attention to the myths of the Native Americans of the region. As you might imagine, knowing the history of the San Luis Valley and the surrounding areas there are a plethora of legends and myths of the Native Americans that are of immense interest to us here. Around a dozen different Native American tribes have called the area home for centuries, with some research suggesting that the San Luis Valley has been home to humans for around 7,000 years. Some such tribes refer to the region, or more specifically the mountains that surround the valley, as the location of the Sapapu or the place of creation or emergence. Perhaps the Blanc Massif is one of the most mysterious mountains of the San Luis Valley. According to the Navajo, this is the location where star people enter our world, and they do so on flying seed pods. This is a particularly interesting legend for several reasons. Firstly, what exactly are seed pods? Might this be a description of the flying saucer-type UFO that we're all familiar with today, if only in concept. Most interesting, though, especially when we consider theories surrounding similarly mysterious locations such as Skinwalker Ranch, is the concept that portals and the use thereof might lay at the heart of many of the bizarre incidents and events witnessed in the area. If the Star People did use the Blanca Massive to enter our world, does this mean that some kind of portal or interdimensional gateway exists there? 
as well as such creation myths, are the many legends of beast-like shapeshifters that seemingly roam the vast regions of the San Luis Valley. Many of these, as we will examine shortly, might well be ancient accounts of the Bigfoot encounters that are witnessed there regularly still today. The San Luis Valley has seen hundreds of cases of cattle mutilation over the decades. In fact, the first case of such mutilations to bring the issue into the wider public consciousness is largely agreed to have happened to a horse in the region named Lady, although most referred to as Snippy, on September 27, 1967. Some sources state other dates, even as early as the 9th of September. The mutilated three-year-old Appaloosa horse was discovered by Harry King, who cared for the horse with his sister, Nellie Lewis, and his mother, Agnes. They had gone to feed the animal and became immediately alarmed that she wasn't waiting at the fence for her usual treats. Upon going to look for her, they discovered Lady on her side, with the flesh from her head stripped completely and cleanly to the bone. There were also cuts to the body that were so precise anyone who saw them knew they could not have been made by a natural predator. Even stranger, there was no sign of any blood anywhere at the scene. Given the nature of Lady's wounds, this should not have been the case, and what's more, a strong chemical smell was prevalent in the air around where the dead horse lay. There were further anomalies. For example, given that it appeared the horse had been dead for several days, there was no bloating or any signs of decomposition. Also of interest was the fact that no scavengers had attempted to take their fill from the carcass. This could be pure coincidence, but perhaps suggests that whatever was done to Lady made her dead body unappealing to such predators who would normally have feasted happily on the gift meal. They made further intriguing discoveries at the scene around the horse. For example, the footprints of the dead horse stopped suddenly around 100 feet from where her dead body now lay. Just how had she come from that point to her final resting place? Perhaps strangest of all was the burn marks on the ground near the dead horse, as well as some which appeared to form a distinct circular object. Of course, such discoveries would suggest to those in UFO circles that such circular scorch marks were the sign of an extraterrestrial involvement, and the markings were from their circular craft. These claims were perhaps taken even more seriously when Agnes King recalled seeing an unknown object go over her house in the days leading to the grim find. In fact, so seriously was the possible connection taken that the Aerial Phenomenon Research Organization, or APRO, one of the biggest UFO investigation groups at the time, would investigate the case. One person who examined the body of Lady was Dr. John Altshuler, who also had an interest in UFOs. When he examined the animal's remains, he would discover that heart, lungs, and thyroid had been removed, and, like the cuts to Lady's body, these cuts were medically precise. He would find the same had been done to the brain and abdominal organs. He would also discover that the body had seemingly been drained of all its blood. Remember, there was no blood anywhere at the scene. Was this unfortunate horse the victim of an alien experiment? Might that explain the advanced and surgically precise nature of the wounds? If that's the case, then we have to ask why. Is it merely to study such animals, or might there be an altogether more chilling endgame to such experiments, one that might one day place humans in the unfortunate position of Lady the Horse? There were, of course, many theories as to what might have happened to Lady aside from that she fell victim to the experiments of visitors from outer space. And, as we mentioned earlier, whether we believe in UFOs and aliens or not, it's easy to see why such a suggestion would be made in such a serious tone. Some, though, put the blame at the feet of such groups as satanic cults or devil worshippers, and many still believe this to be the case today. However, this would mean cults whose members had advanced knowledge in medical procedures, as well as being able to leave no tracks of their presence at the scene whatsoever. Perhaps not impossible, but still highly unlikely. As the case was investigated over the decades, and perhaps as cases of cattle mutilations began appearing all over the United States and South America, some investigators and researchers began to wonder if these brutal experiments might be the responsibility of intelligence agencies 
were a top-secret department of the government themselves. These claims perhaps took on a little more credence when some local residents claimed to have witnessed military fighter jets seemingly patrolling the area in the days after. Some would even suggest an intertwining of the UFO and secret government theories by stating that the government was working in conjunction with apparent extraterrestrial entities who had a discreet, permanent presence here on Earth. As we might imagine, most claims of this nature were dismissed by most. Whatever the truth might be and what might have happened to Lady, it was seemingly clear to all that something out of the ordinary had taken place. Perhaps unbelievably then, when the Wadsworth Ayer for the Condon Committee concluded their investigation, they would state that there was no evidence to support the assertion that the horse's death was associated in any way to abnormal causes. They did not, however, offer an explanation for the lack of blood at the scene or in the carcass itself. Even more dismissive was the response to the Lewis family by Alamosa County Sheriff Ben Phillips, who, despite never visiting the location himself, claimed that it was likely a lightning strike that had killed the horse. Incidentally, during early press coverage of the case, Lady was misnamed in reports as Snippy, who was actually her sire. Consequently, as such press coverage was picked up around the country and ultimately the world, the name stuck and continued to do so over the years. As I mentioned, there are many other cases of cattle mutilation in the San Luis Valley, and while we don't have time nor space here to examine each and every one of them, it's perhaps worth examining the sheer number of cases, although we should note that the vast majority of these cases involved cows, not horses. Much like elsewhere around the U.S. and at other locations around the world, as the 1970s unfolded, cases of cattle mutilation began to increase dramatically, and this continued in most places for the decades that followed. Researcher and investigator Christopher O'Brien discovered that over 200 reports had been made by multiple ranchers in the San Luis Valley region. However, O'Brien believes that, much like UFO reports, the majority of these incidents go unreported, and because of this, the real total is much more likely to be around 1,000. We will turn our attention to some of the UFO sightings in the San Luis Valley shortly, however, it's perhaps worth our time examining some of the many sightings and encounters with mysterious and strange creatures and entities at this most interesting location. And as much as there are UFO connections to the above case of cattle mutilations that we've examined, it might prove one day to be the case that there's a connection to the many strange beings that appear to inhabit this stretch of land. For example, one of the strangest sightings in the San Luis Valley region is known, at least loosely, as the Woman in Red. According to the Internet Forum user, an incident in the spring of 1992 was reported by the uncle of one of the towns of the San Luis Valley's police chiefs. The witness claimed that one evening, while he was driving into town, he noticed a strange woman, dressed all in red, walking calmly by the roadside. He pulled up his pickup truck and asked the woman if she needed a ride. Without saying a word, the woman climbed into the passenger seat. It was only when the witness turned toward her to ask where she'd like to go that he noticed she had goat-like legs, complete with hoofs for feet. Then, before he could truly contemplate what he was seeing, the woman disappeared into thin air. When the police chief in question received the report, as bizarre as it was undoubtedly was, he would state that his uncle was a devout, stable man and therefore he accepted that he most definitely saw something strange that evening. Even so, he attempted to convince his uncle from filing the report, but he insisted on making it official and having the incident placed on record. As strange as this incident was, Without a doubt, one of the most persistent sightings of strange creatures in this region of the western United States is that of Bigfoot, and it is there where we will turn our attention next when Weird Darkness returns. The Lord of the Elements wants to change reality. 
He's enlisted the evil Zeltan to help him, and together they'll try to recruit Stanley, a man gifted with incredible imaginative capabilities to help them. Unless Edward and his friends can stop them, that is. A tale of white and black magic, quantum physics, and a plot that twists and turns. If you like science fiction, fantasy, and horror, you'll love The Last Observer, A Magic Battle for Reality by G. Michael Vasey, narrated by Weird Darkness host Darren Marlar. Hear a free sample of The Last Observer on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. There have been hundreds, if not thousands, of Bigfoot reports from the San Luis Valley. And while those reports could make up an entire book in their own right, some are worth examining here. Perhaps, not surprisingly, researcher Christopher O'Brien has documented many of these sightings during his time researching the strange activity in the region. And these sightings, much like UFO encounters, often come in waves. For example, in late December 1993, Stretching into the first week of January 1994, seven encounters were officially reported to the local police department. What's more, according to O'Brien, each of these encounters occurred in the same seven-square-mile radius within the San Luis Valley. We might wonder how many other sightings and encounters occurred during this time that was simply not reported. One of the reports, which occurred on December 31st, featured several definite tracks of huge footprints, some of which were so distinguished even the toenail could be made out. The local police would even manage to capture part of the track on video. They went on for several hundred yards, negotiating various different terrains as they did so. One of the most intriguing Bigfoot encounters during this wave of sightings in late 93, early 94 came from a mother and son. According to their account, They had spent the day in the mountains and, with night approaching, decided to set off back home. However, during the drive they witnessed a huge, dark, hairy creature with large pointed ears and large glowing eyes. The creature definitely stood upright, like a person, before it dropped down on all fours and ran away like a dog. Whether this was a Bigfoot or some other bizarre monstrous beast is unknown. The sightings even included a white Bigfoot, which are usually sighted in the Siberian regions. Might this be yet another sign that portals and gateways are at work? Interestingly or not, during the same approximate time frame, the San Luis Valley region, as well as the wider Colorado area, experienced a flurry of UFO sightings. Whether or not there is a connection remains open for debate. One of the most intriguing is also to be found in the files of Christopher O'Brien. The case in question occurred in August 2000 and was originally filed with the Bigfoot Research Organization database. The incident was witnessed by two ATV all-terrain vehicle operators while on the Blanca Peaks. As they were riding on the slope, they witnessed what they thought was a man ahead of them. However, they soon realized that the man was all the same color from head to toe. They slowed their vehicles and watched the figure walk and disappear into the trees at the side of the slope. They continued down the roadway for another 300 yards before bringing their vehicles to a stop. They decided to go looking for the strange creature. They walked into the trees and began their cautious search. After walking around 200 yards, they emerged into a meadow. Before they could fully take in their surroundings, one of the men witnessed it running toward trees on the other side of a small field. He immediately called out that he could see the figures causing the other witness to turn. They would later describe the strange creature as being a light to a medium brown with shaggy long hair. What's more, it was around seven feet in height and moved at a considerable pace. Although they would continue their pursuit, they soon lost sight of the creature and returned to their vehicle. Yet another bizarre encounter also comes to us from the research files of the previously mentioned Christopher O'Brien. According to the witness, he was camping near Winchell Lake at some time in the early 1980s when they encountered something truly bizarre. The witness would tell O'Brien that he was fishing at the lake. He noticed a huge, white buffalo that had seemed to appear out of nowhere. Even stranger 
After staring at him for several moments, the huge white beast appeared to vanish into thin air. When the witness walked over to where the suddenly appearing beast had stood, there were no tracks or markings anywhere to be found. On another occasion, in the same area near Winchell Lake in late 1993, which also coincided with other paranormal-type incidents in the region at the same time, such as UFOs and Bigfoot encounters, came a wave of prairie dragon sightings. These strange creatures are described by researchers as flat slugs and appear in groups, moving their way across the floor. They have no legs, however, and leave no tracks of any kind. Some people have even reported them as coming out of sealed walls. On yet another occasion, a local resident witnessed what appeared to be a suddenly appearing platypus, an animal that simply should not have been in this part of the world. Indeed, there are numerous other reports of strange creatures, deformed-type fish, and all manner of strange creatures that appear in the San Luis Valley. We'll turn our attention now, though, to examine one of the most intriguing and disturbing legends of the area. Perhaps some of the strangest encounters involve an entity referred to locally as Old Scratch, a being that some believe to be the devil himself. The sightings are perhaps more urban legend than anything else. However, given the truly strange nature of the San Luis Valley, combined with the notion that most legends may harbor at least partial truths, we should most certainly examine them here. The basic story usually unfolds in a cantina, when a tall, handsome, well-dressed stranger walks into the premises and makes a move toward whoever the prettiest girl might be on the premises. Once near to her, he mesmerizes her and appears to put her in a zombie-like state where she simply can't take her attention away from him. The story then normally states that other locals begin to notice something out of the ordinary and untoward taking place and turn their attention to this well-dressed stranger. The accounts, depending on who is telling them, then go along differing routes. Some state that when the locals approach the man, he morphs into a devil-like creature with claws and cloven hooves. Some reports even state that a devil's tail emerges on his lower back. Realizing he's outnumbered, though, the devil creature usually makes a quick getaway out the door and disappears into the night just as fast as he emerged. Legends of the alleged appearances go back over a century and tend to occur, incidentally or not, during the season of Lent. The last officially recorded encounter with this apparent demonic entity occurred as recently as 1984. I've covered before in the podcast Legends of the Jinn, and some researchers believe encounters such as these are most likely encounters with such mysterious entities. Might this be the case? After all, many legends of the Jinn speak of them appearing in forms so as to confuse and trick their victims. They also speak of them attempting to take control of our minds. It's certainly intriguing speculation. As mentioned, along with all the strange creatures and entities in the San Luis Valley, there is an abundance of UFO sightings and encounters on record. And what's more, these sightings continue, not only in the San Luis Valley but throughout the state of Colorado today. One of the most intriguing claims to come out of the San Luis Valley region surfaced in the mid-1960s when a local resident, Robert Whitting, claimed to have been contacted by aliens in the area. According to his account, he was driving along the highway when a strange and bizarre vehicle suddenly appeared alongside his car. At the same time, telepathic communication began between whatever intelligence was on board the craft and the witness. The voice told him that a dead animal was lying in the road ahead of him and would cause him to crash if he didn't slow down. He took the advice seriously, slowed his vehicle, and did indeed see a dead, black dog laying in the road. Furthermore, after this initial incident, Whitting claimed that he had several more telepathic communications over the coming months. While it would be impossible to document each and every UFO sighting in the San Luis Valley region, which perhaps tells us just how many of them there are, it is sufficient to say that sightings of all manner of crafts and glowing lights are witnessed there and have been for some time. Whether it's glowing orbs and strangely dancing lights, 
to triangular black crafts and disc-shaped vehicles that move with breathtaking speed, all manner of UFOs are on record as having been witnessed in this region of the United States. Now, in the 21st century, a dedicated hangar known as the UFO Watchtower receives thousands of UFO enthusiasts and researchers every year. And there's perhaps a good reason for that, as many, many UFO sightings are witnessed there every year. That might be because, when stood on the artificial platform, viewers have a 360-degree view of the entire San Luis Valley. Like many other similarly intriguing and paranormally active locations around the world, the big question remains – just why do so many strange incidents unfold here? Just what makes the San Luis Valley so special? Might it be the elements and geomagnetic conditions of the valley itself? Might the fact that mystical mountains surround it have anything to do with this? And might this be why UFOs have an apparent connection to not only the mountains of the San Luis Valley, but of many other mountains, equally mysterious all around the world? And if this was the case, and some kind of magnetic anomaly was causing portals or gateways to open to other dimensions, does that suggest there is a connection between seemingly different aspects of the paranormal? Or does it simply mean that such conditions are what these differing anomalies require for us to see them? Might, for example, the rate of vibration somehow merge, if only temporarily, and so allowing both realms of existence to share the same space? There are, of course, more questions than adequate answers about why the San Luis Valley is so rife with strange activity and goings-on. And because of this, researchers and investigators will continue to study the region and its legends for some time to come. When Weird Darkness returns, we'll look more closely at one particular mystery of the San Luis Valley, but not confined to that location. It's the mystery and possible explanations and strange theories of cattle mutilations. Up next. Sometimes you feel a bit nutty, especially if you're a weirdo. If that feeling transfers to your taste buds as well, I've got some great news for you. Weird Dark Roast Nutty Mummy Coffee. Wrap your taste buds around this medium dark roast blend with shrouds of almond, honey, and chocolate. Each bag of Nutty Mummy is exclusive to Weird Darkness and is roasted to order, then bandaged, I mean bagged, specifically for you to ensure maximum freshness for you, your mummy, and anyone else you share it with. Entomb your old coffee and bring your taste buds back from the dead with Weird Dark Roast Nutty Mummy at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Although there is a mountain of theories and claims to explain them, cases of cattle mutilation have perplexed researchers, investigators, and law enforcement for decades. Indeed, the phenomenon remains as unexplained today as it did when cases began to pile up during the 1970s. The fact is, though, cattle mutilation is very real. After all, we have the remains of these unfortunate animals as a grim testament to just how real and often it occurs. And while a great many of these mutilations involve cows or bulls, sheep, goats, horses, and deer, even cats, dogs, and rabbits have been discovered in a similar state of medically precise mutilation. But what might be behind them? Are they the victims of an unknown alien experiment or research program? If so, how might our collective existence fit into such speculative extraterrestrial experiments and will they prove to be beneficial or drastically detrimental to us? Or is a top-secret government department responsible for these brutally medically precise acts? Whether it's one of the above, random acts of satanic groups, or simply some kind of sophisticated if questionable hoax, cases of cattle mutilations continue to leave those who investigate and research them 
largely at a loss as to why they're taking place. Before we examine some of the most intriguing and disturbing cases of cattle mutilation, however, we'll examine, albeit briefly, how the phenomenon introduced itself to the consciousness of the world's populace. We've examined what is arguably the first case of cattle mutilation, previously that of Snippy the Horse, who was actually named Lady. So while we'll not go over that case here, we'll most certainly examine some of the many other accounts on record from across the world. It's perhaps, though, worth mentioning what could very well be the first case of cattle mutilation on record from London in 1606, as noted in the official court records of James I. The records note that whole slaughters of sheep had occurred, where nothing's taken from the sheep but their tallow and some inward parts. There were other similar cases in the late 1800s and early 1900s, as recorded by Charles Fort while in Texas, a horse was discovered dead, with surgically precise cuts carried out in order to remove its entire nervous system. Its face had also been completely stripped to the bone. What is particularly interesting about this mutilation is that it occurred in the exact same territory as a wave of sheep mutilations over a century later in 2013. As we can see, while the notion of cattle mutilation as we understand it today didn't seep into the public consciousness until the late 1960s and 1970s, it's still a phenomenon that has likely been with us for centuries. Without a doubt, though, following the snippy-slash-lady horse case, not only were the wider population very much aware of these bizarre and chilling animal mutilations as the 1970s unfolded, they began to happen all over the country. While such mutilations occur around the United States and indeed the world, certain locations appear to be much more active in this grim phenomenon than others. For example, according to the FBI report carried out in the late 1970s, there were as many as 8,000 mutilations that had occurred in the state of Colorado alone. And as we will examine shortly, Colorado is one of the hottest spots of all for cattle mutilation. They continue to occur around the world today, often in short waves, although not exclusively, and often defy reasonable explanations. It might also be appropriate to examine some of the recurring and grisly details of these harrowing incidents, as well as some of the most popular theories as to what might be behind them. For example, these unfortunate animals are often found with every drop of blood drained from the body, something that has been carried out to such a standard that most often there are no signs of blood anywhere in the region where the animals are discovered. Furthermore, there are very often a series of precise medical cuts to the animals with certain body parts, in some cases having been equally precisely removed, as if by a person with advanced medical knowledge of such procedures. In other cases, the animal's internal organs have either been removed or reduced to a strange mush, and in other cases the skin, muscle and tissue around the face has been completely stripped to the bone. Furthermore, and once more leading toward the involvement of highly advanced technology, chemicals not often discovered in animals are often found, as well as increased levels of others. So just what is behind such terrifying attacks? Perhaps one of the most recurring assertions is that extraterrestrials are behind the cattle mutilation phenomena maybe as part of some kind of monitoring experiment regarding life on Earth. Some suggest those behind the attacks could indeed be human, but, as outrageous as it might sound to some, they are time travelers from the future. Of course, if this is true, and we assume that time travel has become possible in the decades or centuries that are yet to unfold, then we have to ask what has taken place in the future that requires such drastic and specific action? Others believe that a top-secret government program is likely behind the mutilations, and there's a small plethora of reasons offered for why this might be. For example, perhaps the motivation would be nothing more than monitoring food supplies in an attempt to prevent the spread of disease, or perhaps the reasons are much darker and might have connections to cloning the world's food. There are also those who believe these cases contain a satanic element to them, and could possibly be a part of rituals or sacrifices. And while these suggestions are perhaps more easily dismissed than others, 
they deserve to remain on the collective back burner of our minds. Perhaps a good place to start examining these bizarre and monstrous mutilation cases is in Cannock Chase, Staffordshire in the United Kingdom, where in 1985 an apparent interrupted cattle mutilation incident occurred. The account comes to us from the files of veteran UFO and paranormal researcher and author Nick Redfern. According to the report, a father and son were driving home one evening in the Cannock Chase area at around 8.30 p.m. when they noticed something strange ahead of them. The youngster saw it first, a triangular-shaped object hovering over one of the fields that lined the roadside. The ground below the bizarre craft was lit up brightly by three lights on the underside of the vehicle. Realizing they were seeing something out of the norm, they brought their car to the side of the road and exited the vehicle. They each moved a little closer to the edge of the road, continuing to keep the strange object in sight. They watched the craft for several minutes, noticing how it didn't make a single sound. Then, without any warning, the craft zipped away at breakneck speed. The pair jumped back into their car, eager to get home so they could contact the local police and report what they had seen. However, that was when an already strange incident turned even stranger. Thinking they would merely record what he saw and then that would be the end of it, the pair were rather surprised that two police officers were sent to their home to take statements from them in person. Even stranger, during the course of those interviews, the pair were told it had been a mistake for them to get out of the car. Whatever the reason for this was not given, nor was any kind of explanation for what they might have seen, the two officers simply left, leaving the witnesses with even more unanswered questions than they had before they made their report. It was two days later when another incident unfolded involving an almost identical craft, and more importantly for our purposes here, might suggest an attempted cattle mutilation. On this occasion, the main witness was in the countryside of Cannock Chase at a little after 4 a.m. with friends who were hunting ducks. During this hunting trip, he noticed a strange light moving with significant pace overhead. That was until it brought itself to an apparent controlled stop over several cows that were in a field underneath. Enthralled with what he was seeing, the witness moved closer to the field, when he did so, however, it appeared that whatever intelligence was behind the craft noticed his movements. Within seconds, several bizarre and futuristic light beams shot out from the object. Now a little more frightened than he was only seconds earlier, the witness turned and ran back to the cover of the woodland. By the time he had the courage to return to the scene, the object was gone. Was this a case of a cattle mutilation that was interrupted? Was that also the purpose of the UFO sighting only two days earlier? And if so, why would the presence of someone powerless to stop the abduction of a lone cow cause the perpetrators to stop? Perhaps most crucial of all, if the purpose of these sightings was to abduct and mutilate cattle, does that confirm an extraterrestrial involvement in such cases? Of course, that is if we assume that the intelligence behind these strange aerial objects is of an extraterrestrial nature. They might, as some people believe, be top-secret vehicles of the world's militaries. And if that is the case, what's the purpose and end goal of these brutal mutilation cases? Coming up, a spate of mutilations that took place in 2010, but this time it was sheep. That's up next on Weird Darkness. To what lengths will someone go in order to survive? Does the survival instinct override their conscience and allow them to commit not only murder but also the taboo act of cannibalism? What happens when a person crosses the line from dark fantasy to real-life acts of brutal rape, murder, and cannibalism? Are these people driven by a desire so insatiable that they're incapable of controlling it? Murderous Minds Volume 3 – Stories of Real-Life Murderers That Escape the Headlines is the latest offering in a series that takes you inside the lives of killers who committed cold-blooded murder 
for a glimpse at events that drove them to kill. Authored within a historical context, each chapter is an unbelievable venture inside the dark and twisted world of real cannibal killers whose names and crimes might not be familiar to you. By weaving a tale in which dark fantasies become reality, this audiobook invites you to see life from a perspective few ever witness, from that of the killer. Along with a historical look at cannibalism through the ages, these stories beg the listener to answer the question, was the murderer committing cannibalism because he was incapable of resisting the urge to kill and consume, or is the explanation simply pure evil? Murderous Minds, Volume 3 Written by Ryan Becker and Curtis Giles Vasey Narrated by Weird Darkness host Darren Marlar Hear a free sample on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com We will stay in the United Kingdom and mainland Europe for a little while longer, as such cattle mutilations that we might more readily associate with ranches across the United States also take place there. We'll start, though, with a spate of mutilations that occurred during the summer of 2010, when several sheep were discovered mutilated. During the opening months of 2010 in Shrewsbury, England, various farmers would make the grim discovery of the mutilated corpses of their respective sheep and these corpses contained many of the same injuries and evidence of precise procedures as the more traditional cow and bull mutilations. For example, some of these unfortunate sheep were discovered with their faces completely stripped of flesh, and rather than simply having been torn away in a rage, it was removed with the utmost skill and precision. Even more disturbing, some of the sheep were discovered with a hole in their heads, seemingly neatly drilled and with their brains completely removed. Other harrowing discoveries were the clean and precise removal of various internal organs and other medically precise sample-like cuts. Perhaps strangest of all were the claims from some that they even witnessed laser-type beams aimed at sheep below, coming from strange aerial crafts above them. Other witnesses to these strange events would state that they witnessed orange spheres in the skies over the fields the sheep called home. The events seemed to reach a culmination of sorts in March 2010 while a team of on-site investigators were in the middle of their investigation. On the night in question, the investigators, 16 in total, witnessed many of the strange UFOs that farmers and local residents had claimed to have seen over the previous weeks. Even more amazing, several of those investigators even witnessed what appeared to be actual attacks on the sheep, seemingly using Star Wars-type technology. The morning following these events, it was discovered that many of the farms in the area were missing sheep, with some reporting the discoveries of further carcasses from their flocks. The events then died down as quickly as they had begun and remained unexplained to this day. Around a year after the strange sheep mutilations, in and around the Shrewsbury area, another wave of attacks unfolded, this time involving horses in various parts of the UK. And while the events in Shrewsbury certainly suggest some kind of UFO connection, the horse attacks of 2011, which continued into 2012, lend themselves to other dark possibilities. Satanic Rituals The main reasons for this was that many of the mutilated horses were discovered around key dates in the Satanic calendar, specifically St. Weinbald Day. However, while investigators were bound to follow up such possibilities, it was thought the injuries were of too precise and medically advanced nature as to be the work of such cults. On this occasion, though, there were other explanations offered that might have much more credibility. Some researchers and interested parties suggested that the mutilations were carried out as part of a top-secret experiment in light of a recent equine herpes virus type 1 EHV1, outbreak, and this outbreak had seemingly spread quickly through equestrian environments around the world, from the United States to Canada and as far as Europe. 
Whether these particular spate of horse attacks were a one-off and unique to whatever program was behind it, or whether they are the consequences of the same intelligence behind other such animal mutilations around the world, remains open to debate. Without a doubt, one of the most intriguing and unnerving cases of cattle mutilation took place in Wales and went on for over a decade. What's more, after studying these attacks for almost 12 years, the Animal Pathology Field Unit APFU, would announce that their strongest conclusion was that extraterrestrial intelligence was behind them. Not only did investigators point to the laser-like precision of the cuts, as well as the draining of every last bit of blood on the bodies of the sheep, they also noted that many of the farmers whose sheep had been attacked had also noted strange lights on the evenings the respective attacks were carried out. Furthermore, when investigators spoke to other local residents of the areas the attacks took place, they would seemingly corroborate the respective farmers by declaring their own sightings of bizarre light overhead. Investigator Phil Hoyle would elaborate that they were looking into the UFO connection and things people are describing as unconventional things entering the sea and leaving the sea. Wales was, investigators would determine, an apparent hotspot for animal mutilations of the precise kind witnessed between 2001 and 2013 and were very sophisticated, to the point where hoaxers or satanic cults had to be ruled out as reasonable possibilities. Of course, it's perhaps also interesting to note that Wales, at least parts of it along the coast, is also a hotspot for UFO sightings. Some of the injuries discovered on the dead sheep were almost identical to those found during the sheep attacks in Shrewbury in 2010 that we examined earlier, with very precise holes discovered drilled into their bodies. Others had skin and other samples of body parts removed, while some had their faces completely stripped to the bone. The mutilations remain largely unexplained. There are many other animal mutilation cases that have unfolded in the United Kingdom. Many of these have been documented by veteran paranormal researcher and author Nick Redfern, and it is to his research files that we turn to examine our next case, one that took place in the spring of 1977 in Cherrybrook Valley in Dartmoor, England. On the day in question, a local resident, Alan Hicks, was walking across his stretch of land when he, along with his children who were accompanying him, discovered 15 dead wild ponies all of which, according to a newspaper article on the find several months after the discovery, had their bodies mangled and torn. Those with interests in the UFO phenomenon immediately made their way to the area in order to find proof of extraterrestrial involvement. At the same time, other investigators suggested the herd might have been poisoned or simply suffered from a lack of food before dying and becoming victims of scavengers. The Dartmoor Pony Society even suggested that the unfortunate horses had likely succumbed to disease and the former, unknown owner of them, had likely brought their corpses here to discard of them. Things became very quiet regarding the case for almost a decade and a half until the early 1990s when the director of the Center for Fordian Zoology, Jonathan Downs, began to examine the details of the case. During his investigation, he managed to locate and speak with several of the people who'd been involved in the incident at the time. Interestingly and frustratingly for Downs, many of them appeared to be guarded with what they said regarding the grim discoveries of April 1977, so much so that Downs began to suspect the possibility of some kind of interference in the years since the incident by a shadowy agency similar to the Men in Black. Even stranger, the investigator and journalist began to receive all manner of crank phone calls and even sent on elaborate wild goose chases. In fact, these were so detailed and thought out that Downs would state that they could not be the work of a solitary nut harassing UFO believers and that it was much more likely to be the work of paranormal forces or a large and well-financed operation with motives that evade me. That is certainly a serious conclusion and one that sits very nicely alongside other researchers' findings, perhaps most notably Christopher O'Brien. Ultimately, the case remains unsolved over four decades later. Just what did take place in the spring of 1977 on the lonely and often brutal moors of the Dartmoor region? Was there an extraterrestrial involvement, 
Or was the entire episode part of a top-secret government program that went out of its way to blur and muddy any future investigations? We'll stay with Redfern's research for a moment longer as we examine another case of animal mutilation in the United Kingdom. The accounts came to Redfern directly from the person involved, Rob Lee, who in the summer of 2000 would relay accounts that had occurred in the Newport area of England and stretched back to the late 1980s. And these accounts certainly contain details that suggest the work of some kind of ritual cult. According to Rob, one summer's morning in the late 1980s, his father made the grim discovery that five of his sheep had seemingly been attacked and killed during the night. And whatever had carried out the act had seemingly done so with an intelligence in mind. The sheep were all discovered with their throats slid open and had seemingly been purposely laid out in a circle in the field that they were found in. Even more disturbing, several of their internal organs had also been purposely removed and then placed in a purposeful pile in the middle of the circle of dead bodies. It didn't take Rob's father long to rush back inside and report the find to the local police, immediately thinking that some kind of satanic ritual had taken place outside his property involving his sheep, no less, during the night. When the police arrived, however, not only could they apparently find no clues as to what had taken place, but they appeared to warn Rob's father that he should not speak about the incident, certainly not to any press or media outlets. Although nothing else untoward occurred on the family's land after that grim discovery, the incident never left Rob's mind. In fact, he'd even managed to take several photographs of the scene which he duly presented to Redfern. Over the course of the next decade, Rob would conduct his own investigations on such things as ritual sacrifices carried out by secretive cults, and he would begin watching one organization in particular, an apparent group that he would tell Redfern he had dubbed the Cult of the Moon Beast. He claimed this group used ancient rites and carried out animal sacrifice using all manner of animals, including cats and dogs, and even more chilling, the purpose of these rites and rituals was to summon up otherworldly entities that they could then use to their own ends. He further claimed that there were around 15 individuals of this group and that they came from all over the United Kingdom, although he believed they were based in the Bristol area in terms of a headquarters of sorts. He would then reveal to Redfern that he had followed the group for over half a decade and even managed to view three of the ancient rituals personally although obviously discreetly and without their knowledge. When Redfern pressed Rob into what more he knew of the group's rituals, he responded that the entities they were attempting to summon through their rituals came from a realm or dimension that coexisted with ours. This is an interesting detail that we've examined before when looking at such areas as Skinwalker Ranch, the Hudson Valley, the San Luis Valley, as well as when we've examined accounts of reptilians and the Jinn. With that last thought in mind, it's further intriguing that Rob would claim to Redfern that across the planet there are certain locations that are ripe for the opening of portals or gateways, although strict rules and rituals must be followed correctly in order to open them, and this was the purpose of the animal sacrifice. Perhaps with a further nod of the hat to the legends of the Jinn, Rob would describe these entities as being a non-physical intelligence that could take on the appearance of what was in the mind's eye. This description very much sounds like the Jinn. He would then reveal to Redfern that these entities did not use physical means to kill their victims, but rather they killed them through mind power, fright, and suggestion. Essentially, they used fear and scared their victims to death. Furthermore, and something that also sits in well with other conspiracy claims, this group had connections to rich, elite, and influential members of society who would often hire them for their services, and through this, certain well-connected individuals controlled the world's events. Such claims have been made by several researchers of an elite group of individuals whose influence controls almost every aspect of our collective reality. And while many dismiss such notions as nothing other than conspiracy nonsense, Perhaps we should think twice when a high-ranking politician or influential industry leader suddenly commits suicide or suddenly drops dead of a heart attack. Might they have done so simply due to fright, as asserted by Rob Lee? 
or because the sightings of strange creatures appearing in front of them were making them question their own sanity. It's certainly an intriguing notion, and one that loans an altogether new perspective on at least some of the cattle mutilation cases that have occurred over the years. Up next, we'll look at the abundance of animal mutilation cases that have taken place in North America when Weird Darkness returns. I'm a man of habits. Okay, truth be told, my bride says I'm boring. I like the same stuff, and that's what I stick with, and that includes what I eat. Even for breakfast, I used to opt for leftover pizza, hot dogs, hamburgers. Uh, did, did I mention pizza? Anyway, now that I'm trying to lose weight and cut back on the carbs, I've had to make changes for breakfast. Now, instead of a big, heavy breakfast, I just grab one of my Built Bars, the best-tasting protein bar on the planet. Built Bars satisfy my hunger with up to 19 grams of protein and also satisfy my sugar craving, despite being less than 3 grams of sugar. And at only about 150 calories per bar, if I'm really hungry in the morning, I can grab two of them and still feel good about it. Try replacing your dessert, or even a meal like breakfast, with a Built Bar. You won't even know it's not really a candy bar. Visit WeirdDarkness.com slash Built and build a box of your own. Use the promo code WeirdDarkness at checkout and get 10% off your entire purchase. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash Built, promo code WeirdDarkness. As we've seen then, while cases of cattle mutilation occur outside of the North American continent, there's no doubt that this particular part of the world experiences more than its fair share of such cases. And while these mutilations take place all over the North American continent, certain hotspot areas in the United States see an unusually high number of such cases. Such states as Colorado, for example, or Arizona. What's perhaps interesting is that both of these locations is also extremely active in terms of UFO sightings and encounters. Might the two be linked? It's certainly the belief of some researchers that they are. It perhaps is appropriate that we start with the seemingly regular cases of cattle mutilation that come out of Colorado, which, as we examined earlier, is a seemingly discreetly important part of the United States, not only in terms of cattle mutilation, but of other mysterious activity, such as UFOs and even Bigfoot sightings. Indeed, some researchers point to Colorado as being the all-important state in terms of unlocking the secrets to such mysteries. Although cases of cattle mutilation in the Centennial State date back to the late 1960s, with a wave of such incidents unfolding in the 1970s, since the end of the 20th century, regular incidents have still occurred there. It's perhaps worth our time examining the, the Manuel Sanchez case from late 2009. At the time that he spoke with the Denver Post in December of that year, he had just discovered the fourth calf seemingly killed during the night by unknown assailants on his ranch. All of them had the same precise injuries, their tongues and udders surgically removed, the skin from the face peeled completely away, as well as their eyes removed. What's more, there was never any blood anywhere around the mutilated body nor any tracks revealing who might have been there and carried out the attack. Sanchez, who has spent decades on such ranches, felt sure the attacks were not down to lions or coyotes who drag their kills and rip and tear flesh, respectively. He could claim that these were perfect cuts, as if they'd been carried out by a laser or a scalpel. He would continue that whoever carried out the attack left no tracks, no blood, no nothing. They don't leave no trace, he said. A little over a half a year earlier in the Trinidad region of Colorado, another rancher, Tom Miller, discovered one of his cattle in similarly grim circumstances. When Miller arrived to feed his cattle one morning in March of 2009, he found his herd raising all kinds of devil and extremely disturbed. Then, however, as he approached the feeding area, he could see the dead calf by one of the troughs. 
He'd recall how the front legs and the torso had been completely removed, leaving a meatless backbone that connected to its hide. By the time he'd turned his attention to the unfortunate animal's face, he could see how the ears had been completely sliced off using surgical precision. When he looked around the calf, he could see that not only were there no tracks to suggest who might have carried out the attack, but there was no blood anywhere on the ground either. Although Miller didn't make any suggestions as to who or what might have attacked the animal, he was certain that it was not a natural predator and had to, at the very least, be the work of medically knowledgeable humans. The grim discovery is just one of many that Miller had been making on his land since 1999. Another hot spot for cattle mutilations is the nearby state of Arizona. One researcher who documented many of these is Kit Metzger, who discovered dead cattle on her land at the Flying M Ranch for years, and the injuries are very much in line with the other cases that we've examined. Internal organs were often cleanly removed, as were sexual organs. Furthermore, on most occasions, parts of the face were removed to the bone and the blood was seemingly emptied completely. One of the things that Metzger's noted during her time experiencing these mutilations, which date back for her to the late 1970s, is that they often occur in waves from June to October, and this is often the case in other locations as well. She also notes that the Easter holiday, for unknown reasons, also often sees increased cases of cattle mutilation. Metzger's also suggested that whoever is behind the cattle attacks they most likely use some kind of muscle relaxant in order to carry out the draining of blood and other procedures. This would essentially paralyze the animal. In the FBI document mentioned earlier, there contains the case of a mutilated bull of Manuel Gomez, who in 1978 discovered the dead animal on his land in Dulce, New Mexico. Gomez would discover the animal with precise cuts to remove tissues and genitals, essentially almost identical injuries to many of the cattle mutilation cases of that decade and since. However, upon examination, police officer Gabriel Valdez, Gomez's bull was found to have a heart and liver that were now white and mushy with the consistency of peanut butter. Further testing revealed extremely high levels of zinc, phosphorus, and potassium, as well as no copper whatsoever. Those who examined the liver were not able to explain these results. Further examination would reveal that the body of the animal was weaker than would be expected for a death that occurred only hours earlier, while the blood that was left did not clot. General tissue damage and discoloration was also discovered. While it was speculation that was later officially dismissed, initial thoughts of investigators and scientists involved in the examination leaned toward the death of the animal being caused by a concentrated wave of radiation. This is a detail that would also sit comfortably with many close-proximity UFO sightings, which often feature claims of increased radiation. Of course, we should perhaps also mention that Dulce is another location that is surrounded in mystery and conspiracy including an increased UFO presence and top-secret government activities. Coincidence? Surely not. During the summer of 1990 in Vancouver, Washington, local farmers and residents would experience an entire summer of bizarre activity and cattle mutilations. One of the farmers most affected was Richard Fazio, who would discover five of his cattle dead and mutilated between June and October of that year. Each time, they had injuries that Oregon State University would conclude were identical to an electrosurgical excision or a laser-type heat-induced injury. Even more chilling, these unfortunate animals were found with eyes, tongues, and even internal organs cleanly removed, so much so that it was extremely unlikely that predatory animals were the culprits. There were also intriguing reports from Fazio's neighbors of strange sounds that could be heard at seemingly random times during the time of the cattle mutilations. Perhaps strangest of all was a report from a local woman who claimed to see a little man who was running through a field along the roadside and who appeared to be carrying something akin to a flashlight. So, these details would perhaps suggest an extraterrestrial involvement at least as far as the Vancouver mutilations of 1990 go. However, not everyone is as convinced. 
veteran paranormal researcher Christopher O'Brien, who's carried out extensive research in cattle mutilation that can be appreciated in the book Stalking the Herd, Unraveling the Cattle Mutilation Mystery, we comment to Oregon Live that cattle mutilations were more complicated than aliens. While he would offer that one in ten of such cases might have suggestions of extraterrestrial involvement, although generally there is very little evidence to support that. It is O'Brien's thoughts that a covert environmental monitoring process might be involved that was connected to a shadow-type government using advanced technology. He go on to describe it as possibly being the greatest unsolved serial crime spree in history and that there could be multiple groups involved. We should perhaps remind ourselves of the strange incident that occurred just short of a decade later in February 1999 when several forest workers witnessed a saucer-like craft stalking and lifting an elk into the air. Might this have been connected to the incidents during the summer of 1990? We mentioned earlier that according to Kit Metzger, many cattle mutilations take place between the months of June and October, and that was very much the case in Texas during that time period in 2013 when multiple sheep mutilations occurred. Not only did law enforcement investigate the grim cases, but the UFO organization MUFON also conducted their own investigation, and what's more, upon doing so it became clear that the mutilations were too clean to be an animal, with the local sheriff adding that whoever did this knew what they were doing. However, the two investigative teams differed somewhat in who they believed to be responsible for the mutilations. While law enforcement believed firmly that the work was that of humans, most likely in the form of a satanic group, MUFON, perhaps understandably, believed there to be a possibly extraterrestrial connection. Whatever or whoever was responsible for the attacks, those whose animals fell victim to them suffered the consequences. One particular family, the Dags, would see over 20 of their herd mutilated during the apparent wave of attacks, and each was almost identical, with the unfortunate sheep having been drained of blood while also suffering very medical-type cuts to the face area. Like many other cases, no blood was ever present on the ground, and no footprints or other markings were discovered either. A particularly intriguing and bizarre case unfolded in 2013 when a rancher in Nebraska, Alex Peterson, discovered one of his cattle dead, with its head firmly wedged into the ground. When he examined the cow, he discovered that there was a distinct lack of earth in its mouth and nostrils, which had the animal have forced its head into the ground of its own accord should have been there. Combined with the depth of the indent, Peterson concluded that the cow must have been dropped to the ground from a vehicle unknown, and while many would automatically jump to a UFO connection, which there very well could be, we should perhaps remind ourselves that black military helicopters are often seen in the same location and the same time as such mutilations. This could also be a possibility here. This wasn't the first of his cattle that Peterson had discovered on his ranch, having discovered three of his cows with extremely medically precise cuts to their bodies. The third cow was actually still alive when he found it, and while he would ultimately have to euthanize it, he did attempt to perform tests on it to see if any details or chemicals were left behind from an attack that had seemingly only just taken place. Unfortunately, those tests did not yield any results. In more recent times, in the fall of 2019, another chilling case of cattle mutilation unfolded, one that left not one drop of blood in the unfortunate bovine. In October of that year, on the Sylvie's Valley Ranch in Oregon, the vice president of the establishment, Colby Marshall, discovered one of his cattle dead, with body parts precisely removed and completely drained of blood. This was the fifth of his bulls to fall victim to whatever brute but surgically precise forces that were behind these attacks in less than half a year. On this occasion, when showing the remains of the most recent victim of his herd to a local media platform, the unfortunate bull was reported to look like a giant deflated plush toy. What's more, as well as having been drained of all its blood, the tongue and genitals were surgically cut out. What was also noticed was there was a distinct lack of predatory scavengers anywhere near the carcass. This is an intriguing detail that often surfaces in other reports of cattle mutilation. 
Just what are buzzards and coyotes, for example, that would happily feed on almost any carcass they happen upon, picking up from these mutilated cattle that makes them keep their distance and decline the chance of a free meal? Although Marshall, the ranch workers, and the local county sheriff are at a loss as to what might be systematically snaring and killing cattle from their herd, they have eliminated many possibilities. For example, they are certain that it's not bears, wolves, cougars, or poisonous plants. Furthermore, there were no signs that the cattle had been shot to death before the precise medical procedures were carried out. Whatever is behind the attacks, it is very much a concern for those at the ranch in question. Indeed, the problem appears to be so concerning to those who work the ranch that they began to patrol the region in pairs and always ensure that they're armed. It's easy to understand that concern. As Marshall himself stated, whatever could take down a 2,000-pound bull would have no problems dealing with a 180-pound cowboy. And we're not even close to covering mutilations that have happened across the globe. Our next stop is Australia that has seen many. Up next on Weird Darkness. Remember staying up late at night while growing up, watching your local TV station's horror host presenting a terrible B-horror movie or so-bad-it's-good sci-fi flick from the 1950s? That's what the Monster Channel at WeirdDarkness.tv has to offer – all day, every day. You can visit WeirdDarkness.tv and immediately be entertained by a horror host and horrible movie. You can even invite your friends to watch with you and use the chat feature to talk about what you're watching. And our monthly Weirdo Watch Party takes place there as well. Get your frights and funnies 24-7, 365 at WeirdDarkness.tv. While the locations we've already covered certainly experience the majority of cattle mutilation cases, the fact is that almost anywhere where cattle are kept, there are mutilation cases to examine. We know, for example, that Australia sees many cases of cattle mutilations. In September 2018, for example, in Queensland, farmers Mick and Judy Cook would make the grim discovery of a dead cow that had quite obviously been subject to mutilation. Not only were its ears and tongue cleanly removed, but its entire udder was also missing. Mick Cook would state to ABC News that it was like the tongue had been surgically removed, adding that he would struggle to do as neat a job with a very sharp knife. Furthermore, despite the obvious injuries, there was no sign of blood anywhere at the scene, nor any sign of a struggle. What further perplexed the Cooks was that the parts that had been removed were just not something you would use perhaps making the situation even more unnerving, when he and his wife traveled a little further onto his land, they discovered another dead cow, although this one appeared to have been dead for some time. However, it still appeared to have the same bizarre injuries as the first, more recently killed cow. The cooks would further reveal that they'd made similar discoveries of mutilated cattle in the same area and in the same manner around ten years previously. Although they thought that it was a truly bizarre discovery, they kept the incident to themselves. However, when they made their most recent discoveries, they decided to make an official report. While skeptical investigators into Australian cattle mutilations often point to coyotes and even Tasmanian devils as likely being responsible for the attacks, other researchers correctly point out that this doesn't explain the medically precise cuts as well as the lack of blood at the respective scenes. In May 2014 in Argentina, during the space of one weekend, a spate of cattle mutilations occurred and then stopped again as quickly as they had started. Each of the cases were remarkably similar to each other in detail, and they are much the same as many cases that we've already highlighted. Cattle were discovered with medically precise cuts, particularly around the face and jaw, which in some cases were stripped to the bone. 
Other precise cuts and incisions were also recorded. One of the farmers in Reconquista in Santa Fe reported that the animal he would eventually discover dead on his land had begun acting strangely in the days leading up to its untimely death. He would claim that it appeared as though it was scared and unnerved. Whether this was purely coincidence or not is unknown. Might it be, though, that whatever eventually carried out the attack had made its presence known to the animal in question? Although these reports received much media attention, many other reports of cattle mutilation can be found in Argentina, both before and after May 2014 incidents. An intriguing case of animal mutilation occurred in May 2001 in Indonesia, when around 200 goats were discovered mutilated. Most of these goats were discovered completely drained of blood and with their hearts removed. In some extreme occasions, only the head and the legs were left. Much like the cattle mutilations in North America and Europe, there was no sign of blood anywhere around where the dead goats were discovered. One researcher who has perhaps shined more light on the subject of cattle mutilations than most is award-winning investigative journalist Linda Moulton Howe, who produced the regional Emmy award-winning television documentary A Strange Harvest in 1980. Howe, a serious-minded and thorough researcher and investigator, would suggest that the wounds and markings discovered on mutilated cattle and other animals were the work of extraterrestrials. The reason for these macabre attacks was likely the need to harvest body parts, either for research or even for the survival of the alien civilization. What's more, how would suggest that the United States government was almost certainly complicit in these mutilations? How would visit the San Luis region in Colorado as part of the documentary following the discovery of a steer on the land on September 29, 1979? Its tongue had been cleanly cut away and the lower jaw had been completely stripped of its flesh. Even more harrowing were the perfectly oval cuts that were made around the eye sockets and its hide. She would ultimately visit Arlen Myers, a laser surgeon at the Rose Medical Center in Denver, in order to learn more about these seemingly medically precise cuts. As part of this, Myers would attempt to recreate the wounds using two dead chickens. On one, he used a laser beam, and on the other, he used a scalpel. While the laser beam was the closest match, it was far from perfect. Myers would claim it would be near impossible to transport the laser-type technology to each mutilation location without being noticed at some stage. However, we might expect if the mutilations are the work of extraterrestrial beings, they likely have highly more advanced technology than we have, both then 40 years ago and now. Interestingly, how would state that the surge in cattle mutilations began in the winter of 1974 into the spring of 1975. Between that time and the 1980 documentary, over 20,000 mutilations had taken place, at least 20,000. What's perhaps interesting here is that the previous year, in 1973, the United States and other parts of the world experienced a wave of UFO sightings that often featured apparent humanoid occupants of the futuristic craft being seen. Were these sightings a reconnaissance-type mission before the regular cattle mutilations began? What is also interesting, one of the incidents during this 1973 wave of UFO and humanoid sightings was that of Judy Doherty, whose account is featured in the documentary and who might have been one of the first people to seemingly witness cattle mutilation taking place. In May 1973, Doherty was driving with her mother, sister, and brother-in-law in the car with her when they noticed a strange light overhead. They watched the light for some time, right until she pulled onto the drive of her home. As they exited the vehicle, they were shocked to see a huge, disc-shaped object hovering over a field nearby. Then it suddenly shot into the sky and vanished. Doherty, though, would begin suffering intense nightmares and would eventually seek hypnotic regression in order to find out just what happened that night. While under hypnosis, it was revealed that after they climbed out of the car, the strange glowing object approached the women, specifically Doherty. During an interview on 21st Century Radio in 1989, Hal would speak of the Doherty incident and what was revealed during the hypnotic regression sessions. She would recall seeing a small calf being taken up toward the craft in a pale beam of yellow light, the next thing she knew, it was as though she was inside the craft, viewing the events as they were taking place. 
she would claim that she could see the calf have pieces of it excised, the tongue, the sex organs, the eyes. Even more harrowing for Doretti was that she would soon see her daughter Cindy on a similar operating-type table. And what's more, these gray alien figures, as per her description of them, were carrying out similar experiments and taking similar samples from her daughter. What was also intriguing about this particular case was that Doherty remained near her vehicle trapped in the light, while her mind was seemingly on board the ship viewing the events that she later described. Might this suggest that alien abduction encounters, at least some of them, are more akin to an out-of-body experience? It would certainly appear to suggest a definite link between cattle mutilations and extraterrestrial entities. Moulton Howe would continue her research into both UFO phenomena and cattle mutilations. A decade after the release of A Strange Harvest, Howe would speak at the MUFON Symposium. During her talk, she would reveal details of a case of cattle mutilation that had occurred in Hempstead County, Arkansas. On March 10, 1989, a rancher, L.C. Wyatt, would discover five of his pregnant cows dead, all laid out in a straight line on his ranch. Only two days previously, each of them had been alive and unharmed. According to a report in the Little River News, one of the cows was positioned with its legs up, as if it had been running and was zapped by something. Indeed, as Howe would state, the initial assessment of the grim scene was that the cows were dropped dead in their tracks. Examination of the carcasses was no less grim. Three of the cows, for example, had a bloodless, cookie-cutter oval piece of tissue removed from the rectum, while another had an eye completely and cleanly removed. Perhaps the worst discovery was that of a huge cut across the belly of one of the cows, out of which was her unborn calf that remained in the unbroken embryo sac. Bizarrely, there was no blood or any other substance that one might associate with such a seemingly savage but medically precise attack. Perhaps even more intriguing, and certainly something suggestive, once more, of a connection between UFOs and these truly horrific scenes was the recollections of the editor of Little River News, Jim Williamson. He would recall that on the night before the cows were discovered dead in the field, he had seen a golden glow in the skies over the Rural Electric Association substation. Williamson would watch the glow for around three minutes before it disappeared. Howe would state that the distance between the substation and where the cows were discovered is between 40 to 50 aerial miles. Howe also drew attention to the fact that later in the evening, on the day the cows were discovered, under the cover of darkness, Arkansas and Hempstead County Sheriff Don Worthy, along with veterinarian Dr. James Powell, went to the site to examine the dead cows. They would even take samples, using flashlights to see. Not only is it strange that the men chose to work in such a way in the dark, but neither has offered any kind of explanation for their decision. This certainly raises eyebrows of suspicion among many with an interest in seeking the truth behind the cattle mutilations, and perhaps rightly so. During the days after the discovery of the dead cows, Williamson would contact pathologist and hematologist Dr. John Altshuler, the same Altshuler who'd examined and taken samples of one of the first mutilated animals the horse known as Snippy, or Lady, we spoke of earlier. Altshuler would issue instructions to Williamson to get a new straight razor and to cut a rectangle of cowhide with the discovered cut in the hide included in it from the cow that had been discovered with the huge cut across its belly. He would also cut tissue samples from the belly and what remained of the eye before sending them in a formaldehyde solution, fast-tracked to Denver, Colorado for Altshuler to examine. He would ultimately conclude that the cutting was done quickly with a hot instrument of some kind and with pinpoint accuracy and minimal dissipation of heat at the cut line. There was also the discovery of a string beam at the edge of the tissues, suggesting something along the lines of laser or hot needle surgery. Examination of the precise oval cut to the hide of the cow revealed changes to the tissue that suggested it had been exposed to temperatures as high as 300 degrees Fahrenheit. Overall, it was the conclusions of Dr. Altshuler that the surgical procedure performed would have very likely took place quickly, probably in a minute or two, and utilized high-temperature heat. He would conclude that the source of this high heat would likely have been a fine probe or cutting instrument. 
Hal would highlight other cattle mutilation cases that had similar details and conclusions. For example, the case of the Grass family who discovered mutilated animals on their land, Pine Ranch in South Dakota, had similar suggestions of a pinpoint heat source. According to a letter sent to Howe from Charlene Grass, they discovered some of their horse's tail here near the mutilated animal, which she had also sent to Howe for analysis. Upon examination, it appeared very likely that it had been subjected to particularly high heat. Perhaps of even more interest is that a neighbor of the Grass family claimed to have seen a strange light over the ranch. Even more harrowing for the Grass family was they would suffer five mutilations throughout 1984, three years later. Another case that Howe states to demonstrate a connection between animal mutilations and alien activity is that of a rancher from Waco, Texas, who noticed one of his cows missing one April morning in 1980. As he was searching for it, having left his truck in order to climb up a small hill on his land, he witnessed two creatures approximately four to five feet high a short distance ahead. He would later state that the creatures were wearing some kind of tight-fitting green clothes, further describing the color like that of mesquite leaves in the spring. It would continue that this clothing even covered the feet and that they had heads shaped like eggs. Some people have described gray alien creatures as having oval-shaped heads. They had a build similar to that of a small adult. It was when the creatures turned toward him, however, that the rancher noticed perhaps one of the most chilling aspects of their appearance. He would describe the creatures as having eyes that angled upward, pointed, and were like big, dark almonds. Of most interest to us here, though, was the detail that the two creatures were carrying a calf with them. The missing cow was pregnant. At this point, being familiar with accounts of alien abductions, the rancher turned and ran back down the hill toward his vehicle. When he got there, he climbed in and headed for home as fast as he could. According to what he told Howe, the incident had alarmed him to such an extent that it was two days before he told his family about it. They'd make the decision to return to the location where he had seen the two creatures. When they did, they discovered the hide of a calf, one that the rancher believed was that of the calf that he had seen the two creatures carrying short distance from the hide, the calf's backbone, without ribs, was discovered. What's interesting, and indeed something we have seen in other cases, despite there being plenty of predators who should have claimed this free meal for itself, there were no signs that any animal had even contemplated taking it. There were certainly no buzzards flying overhead, which he would have expected. He also noticed there was a distinct lack of blood. What connection is there between cattle mutilations and alien abduction? We'll find out when Weird Darkness returns. No matter the time of day or season, sometimes you need to find a way to rid yourself of those ghostly chills that bring raised hairs and goosebumps to your skin. Other times you're looking for those ghostly chills. Either way, it sounds like you need a mug of Weird Dark Roast Coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee has deep notes of cocoa, caramel, and a touch of sinister sweetness that'll send shivers down your taste buds. This is an exclusive coffee that I selected specifically for you, my weirdo family. Weird Dark Roast is not available in stores, coffee houses, mad scientist labs, or even the dark web, but you can find it at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee – fresh roasted to order so it's as fresh as it can be when it lands on your doorstep and knocks three times. Grab yours now at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee does not actually knock on your door because it doesn't have arms or hands, so if you hear knocks at the door and no one answers when you ask who it is, it's probably paranormal and you should just leave the door shut and locked. Howe further highlights a case of alien abduction that appears to show connections to animal mutilations that took place in May 1980 near Cimarron in New Mexico. In fact, she'd state that it was this case that first made her contemplate if alien life forms might be using creatures from Earth for sustenance and to create other life forms. 
On the night in question, a mother and her six-year-old son witnessed two beings in a field that appeared to be beside a crying cow. What's more, these strange entities were plunging a long silver instrument into the unfortunate creature. Several years later, in the spring of 1988, the pair would undergo hypnotic regression in order to unlock any other details of the bizarre incident, which it duly did. According to the details of the session, not only did the mother undergo examinations and have bodily samples taken, she also recalled details of the mutilation of the calf. Perhaps one of the most alarming details that emerged from the mother's session was that she witnessed a humanoid body floating in a tank of a dark red liquid filled with large organs. She believed that these were animal organs. According to the regression sessions, the mother and her son were driving home on the night in question along a quiet road just outside of Cimarron. They expected to arrive at their destination around 9 p.m. By the time they finally did arrive home, it was after midnight, around 1 a.m. According to the mother, as they were driving along, a blinding light suddenly filled the inside of the car. The regression notes state that the mother stated while under hypnosis, how can it fly like that? What is it? It's incredible. This is real. Oh, I'm scared. How can they be doing that to that cow? She would continue that the cow was crying, or in her words, bawling, and was clearly in pain. It was then that she realized the cow was still alive while these unknown procedures were being carried out, procedures she described as pulling it apart. She would further describe how these apparent alien entities cut in a circular motion, as well as seeing one of them take what appeared to be a wide, silver tapered knife, although it was an instrument as opposed to a weapon. It would insert this into the chest of the cow before pulling it back out again. Suddenly, she realized that they themselves were captured by the alien technology. She would recall that she was going in one ship while her son headed toward another. The mother would continue during her hypnosis session that she suddenly found herself inside one of the craft. What's more, it appeared the creatures were stripping her of her clothes despite her attempts to stop them. The next thing she knew, she was laying on a large table before the creatures began to take samples from her, including reproductive samples. She would recall how the creatures had huge eyes, which easily filled more than one half of their face, and were like empty holes. She would also recall how they appeared to be different types of creatures around her, elaborating that some were more repulsive and that some have evil eyes with no pupils, black but with a reddish color that reminded her of the devil. Then she went on to describe another apparent alien entity. This one was dressed in white and had clearly long fingers. The creature had a round head with no hair and had a greenish color about it, similar to jaundice. The creature had a general skeletal appearance to it, but also had big eyes. She noticed there appeared to be three of these types of creatures. She recalled how one of them spoke to her. It's not clear if this was physically or telepathically. They apologized and said that it was unfortunate, but it was necessary what we do, they said. Following the examination, the mother was taken to another location. While this was happening, she saw several other different-looking alien creatures. She would describe them as being all kinds of sizes, with different uniforms and patches. Some of these creatures had ruffled collars, while others appeared to wear long robes. She also recalled seeing figures wearing military-type boots. She would continue that she could recall creatures that had appeared to be mindless robots, while there were others that were monstrous, so monstrous, in fact, that she attempted to run. When she did so, she found herself in an even more alarming environment. After taking to her feet, she suddenly realized she was in a room that was dimly lit and had a sickly sweet smell. She also noticed that there was a large vat of liquid in the room. She was shocked to see the top of a bald head in the liquid. She would claim under hypnosis that there were huge tongues, hearts, and other body parts in the tank. They appeared to be from an animal, possibly a cow, all except for the top of a bald head, maybe one of theirs. As outrageous as these statements might be, there are several cases of people who have claimed to have witnessed similar tanks or vats during alien encounters. Perhaps some of the most intriguing details of the incident would come from the mother while fully conscious in normal recollection after the sessions. 
she would assert that the incidents she'd witnessed and indeed been a part of were part of a treatment or experiment, and furthermore she believed the end goal of these experiments was to assert mind control over humanity. Maybe most alarming were her feelings that, although some of the entities were kinder than others, generally they don't like us, they are monstrous. The abduction encounter is indeed one of the most intriguing on record, perhaps not least as it suggests that several alien races are seemingly working together. And if we assume the claims to be accurate, if the feelings of the mother in this case are even partially correct and these apparent alien creatures do have a certain disdain for humanity as a whole, it should be something that is of concern to all of us. While we've touched on the idea of top-secret government or intelligence involvement in at least some of these cases of cattle mutilation, in his book Underground Bases and Tunnels, What is the Government Trying to Hide?, Richard Sauter puts across a very compelling argument for such a potential involvement. And what's more, he points to the possible technology that's used. He draws our attention to the Laser Medical Pack, developed by the Phillips Laboratory at Kirtland Air Force Base in New Mexico. This very compact device, according to Sauter's writing, provides the field paramedic or physician a unique, portable, and battery-operated laser capability. What's more, this device is completely self-contained and even fits inside a belt pack. Sauter would continue that this device could run for 20 minutes using two two 2-volt batteries for the laser and one 9-volt battery for the electronics. Perhaps of even more interest to us here, is the information that the instrument can cut like a scalpel and even coagulate bleeding and close wounds. Even more intriguing is that the output wavelength can be designed to provide different tissue interactions. What's being described here very much sounds like the kind of technology that could be needed to perform the kinds of medically precise cuts witnessed on the bodies of mutilated cattle. However, while this piece of battery-powered technology may or may not be used in at least some of the cattle mutilations, how would that explain the lack of tracks or even footprints around where the cattle were seemingly mutilated? In our recent episode of Weird Darkness, we looked at the repeated hints and suggestions of a human presence in at least some alien abduction and close encounter incidents. We examined the notion that mind-altering drugs and mind control techniques could have been employed by human perpetrators. And as Sauter also points out, if there is a human element behind at least some of the cattle mutilations, then that could perhaps be the case here also. Before we get to that, though, we'll turn our attention to another observation of Sauter's. Along with the increase in alien abductions throughout the 1970s, at the same time cattle mutilations began to unfold, monitoring programs under the charge of the Environmental Protection Agency EPA, began to unfold. Put into being in 1970, these monitoring programs might, according to Sauter, be of interest to researchers. It was the aim of this monitoring program to regularly test cattle in the region to detect abnormal levels of radioactive isotopes. Of course, if this was present in the cattle, not only might it enter the food chain, but it might be causing adverse effects in humans and the wider environment. What's interesting, though, especially given the technology that we know is available now, is that many of the apparent procedures and tests appear similar to what are carried out in cases of cattle mutilation. Regarding the human monitoring program, around 40 families that lived near nuclear test sites are monitored twice a year to spot any signs of radiation poisoning. And while this is no bad thing, it is, as Sauter writes, most interesting for ufologists, particularly the details of these examinations. Just some of the processes include, for example, having their bodies scanned by a whole body counter, a detail that often comes up in alien abduction accounts. Then there's the room in which these examinations take place, a relatively small room in which the person being examined lies back in a reclining chair. Even more intriguing, many of the instruments used in these examinations come down from the ceiling and hover over the person. Sauter even points out the detail of entire families being examined. If, for example, at least some of these tests are carried out against a family's knowledge or will, might they occur under some bizarre alien abduction smokescreen? We should note these programs were put into motion for legitimate reasons, 
And we're not suggesting that there's any direct connection to some widespread cover-up of discrete activities being undertaken under the guise of UFO and alien activity. The fact is, though, that the technology and the means are very much available should any discrete government or intelligence agency decide to do so. And it's with that element of mind control and false memories in mind that we will turn our attention back to cattle mutilations specifically and how similar techniques might be used there. Up next on Weird Darkness, how mind-altering states might be a part of the cattle mutilation mystery. There is a knock at the door late at night. You answer it to find two small children standing there. You're suddenly filled with an inexplicable fear. Let us in, they say. We need to use the phone. It's at that point the fear turns to utter dread as you see that these kids have completely black eyes. The Black Eyed Kids is an exploration of this terrifying phenomenon using true stories of encounters with black-eyed kids submitted to the My Haunted Life 2 website. G. Michael Vasey examines the evidence and investigates the terrifying black-eyed kids phenomenon, coming to some startling and shocking conclusions. Are they demonic soul-eaters responsible for the disappearance of some of the 90,000 Americans missing at any point in time? Or is this just another urban legend? another boogeyman designed to keep you awake at night. Listen to the book and find out. The Black Eyed Kids by G. Michael Vasey, narrated by Weird Darkness host Darren Marlar. Hear a free sample on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. In the famous Antonio Villas Boas case in 1957, recently revealed information suggests that the abduction was nothing more than a case of the young farmer being subjected to chemicals that drastically altered his sense of reality and forced him to mistake a very terrestrial flying vehicle for a flying saucer, in this case a black unmarked helicopter. Interestingly enough, these black helicopters are often seen in the vicinity of cattle mutilation cases before and after the discoveries, and particularly during waves of mutilation cases. Might it be the case that these black helicopters are not only used to airlift their targeted cattle for the samples to be taken, either on the helicopter itself or to a discrete location elsewhere, and then returned somewhere near where they were taken from? Might this explain the lack of markings and the lack of blood? And in cases where the animal's been discovered seemingly drained of blood, might it be the case that this blood has been intentionally siphoned, perhaps in another location? And then we come to the UFO and alien aspect of cattle mutilations. While we're not suggesting that some or even all of these strange cases are not the work of potential work of extraterrestrials, but if there was a discrete government agency involved, might they use similar techniques as is claimed were used in the Boaz case? Might the region where the cattle are targeted be sprayed by some kind of mind-altering chemical in the unlikely event that there are witnesses to the incident? Or might the use of specifically sequenced lights or even hypnotic sounds or hums have a similar effect? Of course, we would be required to ask just what kind of chemical or procedure would result in each person specifically mistaking a helicopter for a UFO. It is perhaps one thing to have a person under such drugs or trances hallucinate something, but to have them hallucinate something specific is perhaps something else entirely. Or might these memories be implanted after the fact, that any witnesses would be taken into custody and then have false memories implanted afterward to have them remember in a specific way? If this was the case, though, we might expect that at least some people who might have stumbled onto such procedures would not have been noticed and would have recalled a black helicopter lifting an unsuspecting cow 
and would have subsequently reported it. Indeed, perhaps rather than bringing forth answers, contemplating a human involvement in the cattle mutilation cases simply brings more questions bubbling to the already bubbling surface. Whether or not there is a human element behind the cattle mutilations and indeed the UFO and alien question remains to be seen and will remain a topic of conversation in the UFO community. However, if this does prove to be the case, then perhaps above all else, we need to ask the reasons why. While we might understand the need to test families and animals near nuclear test sites for their own and everyone else's safety, if there is any truth to similar experiments and monitoring programs taking place under the guise of alien abduction, then we have to ask why this particular smokescreen? Might it just be that it is so obscure a claim, to most people's thinking, that it puts a further buffer zone between those making such claims and the discrete agency speculatively behind the abductions? Furthermore, does this mean that all claims of alien abduction are nothing but secret government projects and programs, or might their speculative use in their own activities have another advantage of being able to dismiss such genuine claims? And perhaps above all else, are these claims of mutilated cattle, tested families, and strange examinations just the tip of the iceberg? Might these activities be happening in a much more widespread manner and to many more people that most of us would want to even imagine? It would appear that there is an undoubted connection, somewhere and somehow, between UFO and alien encounters and cases of cattle mutilation. And if we can collectively find that connection, it will likely shine a bright light onto the as yet unknown elements of such issues and most likely many others. As we can see then, whatever is behind those most brutal and harrowing events, cattle mutilation is a very real phenomenon, and one that not only disturbs and unnerves the owners of the respective cattle that have fallen victim to such a chilling and untimely death, but one that hurts most financially. And with this thought in mind, should there be revealed a government involvement, not only would it be a public relations disaster, but it would also likely lead to lengthy and complicated lawsuits. So might that potential consequence suggest that the perpetrators are indeed extraterrestrial in nature who simply don't have such concerns of any potential blowback from their actions? Or, as we mentioned earlier, if such an outrageous explanation as time travel did prove to be accurate, then might such consequences simply be outweighed by the need of the mission? While the idea of aliens, secret government programs, and even satanic cults tend to be the first explanations offered to explain these bizarre animal mutilations, there are a number of other, more grounded possibilities that we should at least go over briefly, not least the claims of a clandestine operation connected to the food supply or disease. However, many researchers, despite the nature of the medically precise cuts and apparent knowledge of extracting internal organs, still maintain that natural causes is the most likely explanation for these morose and bizarre deaths. And while there is perhaps understandable resistance to these explanations of natural causes from those who have studied the phenomenon extensively, we should still examine some of them briefly here. For example, some believe that precise cuts to the mouth, lips, or genitals are simply down to contraction due to dehydration or even parasites that burrow into the soft parts of the body. Other details, such as eyes that are completely missing, as well as some internal organs that are explained as being the responsibility of blowflies or even vultures. Even the lack of blood is put to the fact it will move to the lowest point and begin to break down, as well as it could be completely consumed by various insects. Of course, one of the possibilities for natural causes in regard to cattle mutilation is that they could be down to a very terrestrial but unknown creature, one that would have apparent knowledge of medical-type procedures and organ extraction. Far-fetched? Yeah, possibly, but certainly not impossible. Very much like almost all areas of the paranormal, we come away from such examinations with many more questions than answers. However, like such events as UFOs and ghostly encounters from entities from the other side, there are simply too many accounts to draw on to simply dismiss the phenomenon outright. Whether it's the work of extraterrestrial visitors, 
top-secret government agencies, or even time travelers, the details of these horrific cases suggest a professionalism and advanced knowledge that there almost certainly is a purposeful agenda and end goal to which they are carried out. We might wonder, then, what might that end goal be? And where do we as a collective fit into this long, drawn-out plan? Will it be beneficial for us, or one that might spell the end of our civilization? The fact that cattle mutilations are still a part of our lives and collective culture is something that cannot be denied. But what we do about them, and how far we research them in a serious scientific way, will undoubtedly have consequences on our ultimate understanding and, if possible, reaction to them. Thanks for listening. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can also email me anytime with your questions or comments through the website at WeirdDarkness.com. It's also where you can find all of my social media, listen to free audiobooks that I've narrated, shop the Weird Darkness store, sign up for the email newsletter to win monthly prizes, find other podcasts that I host, and find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression or dark thoughts. Plus, if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell, you can click on Tell Your Story. Content in this episode was written by Marcus Louth for UFOinsight.com. You can find a link to the stories used in the show notes. Weird Darkness is a production and trademark of Marlar House Productions. Copyright Weird Darkness. And now that we're coming out of the dark, I'll leave you with a little light. Ecclesiastes 7 verse 9. Do not be quickly provoked in your spirit, for anger resides in the lap of fools. And a final thought from Abraham Joshua Heschel. The test of love is in how one relates not to saints and scholars, but to rascals. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness. <laughs>